Testes. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, good. It's loud and clear. Okay. Okay, okay. Cubaan suara satu, dua, tiga. Cubaan suara satu, dua, tiga. Ada? Saya tak tahu. Oh. Are we using the mic? The, the, the laptop? Are we? Ah, okay. Okay, boleh buat. on contemporary issues in Islamic education, strengthening the foundation of knowledge towards the revival of the Yom. Okay.
Tak kira pansit ke macam ni? Meja nak tak kira pansit ke? Meja ni? Tak, tak. Ah, okay, kalau dia ada di sini ke depan dengan lagi? Okay, okay. Okay, ha, kalau kita pergi. Kalau kau punya food. Kau punya food. Okay, sini lah.
ikut duduk Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I hope tea was fantastic and sufficient enough to get you going for our next agenda. Let us now carry on with a keynote address by Professor Dr. Mohammad Hashim Kamali, the founding CEO of International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies, Malaysia. But before that, please help me welcome Ms. Eda Suhana Sharudin, Director of Islamic Epistemology and Curricular Reform, to deliver an introductory notes of our speaker and thus resume the role of the moderator for today's conference. With no further ado, please help me welcome Ms. Eda Suhana Sharudin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Faris. So this is the brief biodata of uh, Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali. He served as a professor of Islamic law and jurisprudence at the International Islamic University Malaysia and also as a dean of the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, ISTEC, from 1985 to 2007. He is currently the founding CEO of the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies Malaysia and the, the newly appointed chairman of the institute, former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tun Abdullah Haji Ahmad Badawi. Prof. Hashim Kamali served as an assistant professor at Kabul University and subsequently as public prosecutor with the Ministry of Justice, Afghanistan from the year 1965 to 1968. After finishing his studies in, at the University of London, he was then employed by the British Broadcasting Corporation as part of his broadcasting support staff in Reading, United Kingdom from 1976 to 1979. Dr. Kamali served as assistant professor at the Institute of Islamic Studies, McGill University in Montreal, and was subsequently a research associate with the Canada Council for Social Science and Humanities from the year 1979 to 1985. He was a visiting professor at Capital University in Ohio in 1991, and later served as visiting professor at the Institute, of Ad Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin, Germany. Then, Prof. Kamali served as a fellow of that institute, and also a member of the Royal Academy of Jordan. He served as a member and sometime chairman of the Constitutional Review Commission of Afghanistan, um, in the year 2003. He is currently on the International Advisory Board of 11 academic journals published in Malaysia, United States of America, Canada, Kuwait, India, Australia, and Pakistan. In May to June 2004, and subsequently in October 2007, he served as a UN consultant on constitutional reforms in the Maldives, and as a UN constitutional law expert on the constitution of Iraq. He is also currently a Sharia advisor with the Security Commission of Malaysia, member of the CIMB Sharia Board, and chairman of Sharia Board, Stanley Corporation of South Africa. Prof. Kamali has addressed over 1, sorry, 120 national and international conferences, published more than 16 books and over 100 academic articles. He delivered the prominent scholars lecture series number 20 at the Islamic Research and Training Institute of Jeddah, Saudi Arabia and in 1996 and the Mutaka Sultan Ahmad Shah lecture in Kuantan in 2002. With that, I present to the audience Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali. Put it there, is it? 
put it not put it there it's okay eh? it should be okay right okay bismillahir rahmanir rahim nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al karim thank you madam moderator uh, for your kind introduction uh, today my topic is maqasid al sharia past achievements and future challenges Uh, in the context of the conference contemporary issues in islamic education <clears throat> the subject is fairly wide and i it, the literature has grown fairly rapidly on maqasid al sharia especially since mid 20th century and it would not be feasible to offer a general picture in any detail but it's like a stock case, stock taking where we are what are the issues what are the achievements uh, maqasid al sharia is i'll refer briefly to the history of this discipline and then the renewed interest what are the reasons for this revival of interest i will speak a little a bit about the definition Uh, and the three tendencies that exist uh, since the mid 20th century uh, opening the scope of maqasid some tend to exaggerate others tend to be reductionist and there is of course the third approach of tawassut in i'tidal and i'll have a few words to say about that um then i will focus on the identification of maqasid how we identify it and that will relate to the scope of the maqasid uh we identify maqasid by looking at the quran and sunnah and also ijtihad but can we accept rationality for example and uh, innate human nature or fitra as identifier of the maqasid Uh, then there is a uh, ijtihad maqasidi uh, maqasid oriented ijtihad which has become a, mm, a phrase a commonly used phrase what do we mean by it it does imply that maqasid can be the basis of ijtihad uh, implying that we can do this without even looking at the resources of the usul al fiqh is that accurate Uh, we'll have a few words on the maqasid in the wasail the maqasid the sharia consists of these two parts the purposes and the means towards achieving those purposes uh, but uh, the the maqasid are are not you know existing facts in reality they are something that we are working in order to realize they are realized through their proper means uh, <clears throat> the history of maqasid we know that the maqasid was a latent development in the history of islamic juristic thought uh, it was uh, uh, the andalusian scholar ibrahim al shatibi who uh, focused on the maqasid in open this as a new chapter of islamic juristic thought uh, before that there were some contributions by scholars like azuddin abdul salam al sulami by one or two others even going back to the 4th century but those were incidental references to maqasid it was for the first time that al shatibi who is also known as the shaykh al maqasid he died 790 hijra 1388 that is almost 14th century or 8th century almost 5 centuries after or 6 centuries after the crystallization of the science of usul al fiqh the usul al fiqh came about mainly in the 1st 2nd and 3rd century with the emergence of the mazahib um but this was a latent development what was the reason for it the reason for this was um uh, uh 
the reason for this belated development of the maqasid was the orientation of maqasid toward philosophy. Uh, you ask what is the purpose of the lawgiver be behind uh, enacting this particular hukum or that hukum. Uh, what and why and you uh, explore the, the reasons behind the philosophy behind this. This was not quite in line with the literary tradition of the ulama of Usul al fiqh who would look at the text, interpret the text, and the next step was analogy to the text, and this was the way that they would expand the scope of uh, uh, the nusus in analogy to the nusus in the scope of the ahkam of sharia. Uh, whereas maqasid did not really tally with this. We do not look at the text as such. Uh, and it was the literary, literary tradition, the textual textualist orientation of the ulama of usul that did not encourage the maqasid. Although we, if we look at the Quran, for example, uh, some scholars said that there are 200 references in the Quran to the purposes of the Akam. But Ibn Qayyim al jawziya mentioned that in, in over a thousand places, the Quran makes indication direct or indirect by allusion, uh, liking and disliking, of so on and so forth. Uh, the Quran is very purpose-oriented. It is value-oriented. And why was this, for example, notwithstanding this kind of, the, the kind of extensive presence of the maqasid in the Quran? Uh, they were marginalized by the ulama of Usul al fiqh So that was basically uh, the reason. Uh, and when al shatibi wrote his four volume uh, on al muwafaqat fi Usul al sharia uh, he also uh, dedicated three volumes to the usul al fiqh and one, the last volume, uh, to the maqasid. His purpose was not to create a new sharia or a new uh, genre of, you know, of usul al fiqh This was something, a chapter. Uh, nowadays, people... Uh, think that, uh, well, okay, look at the ahkam, almost as if independently of the rest of sharia. When we speak, when we say the maqasid al-sharia, we mean that the maqasid arise from the sharia. There is no marginalization of the sharia, no marginalization of the usul al-fiqh. My approach has always been that we look at the maqasid in the usul al fiqh together. Um, <clears throat> uh, then uh, I look at, uh, at, at the uh, definition uh, coming to technicalities. I will not try to be technical. Definitions of things are, you know, uh, precise reading, but uh, the several definitions have been given. Interestingly enough, the architect, the chief architect of the Maqasid, Al Shatibi, he did not give a definition to the Maqasid. He used the word Maqsad in Maqasid. Sometimes the words are so uh, ex expressive of, of the, its meaning, like the Haq, Kalima of Haq, right. Uh, we did not have a definition for haq, possibly because some Arabic words are expressive of their meaning and purpose so well that uh, people do not think it necessary to give it a definition. But uh, it was uh, Ibn Ashur and died in 1974, the Tunisian scholar and the author of a book Maqasid al-Sharia al islamiyah who offered the definition, a comprehensive de definition, and uh, <coughs> he looked at the Maqasid 
uh, saying that, that these can, these are and the the maani and uh, the hikmah and the meaning in wisdom uh, behind and the ahkam of sharia and the deeper meaning in the inner wisdom that the lawgiver Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had contemplated uh, behind introducing the ahkam of sharia uh, and he added that uh, this is the case with regard to all or most of the ahkam of the sharia uh, ar around the same time al al fasi uh, also a contributor to the subject from Morocco. Uh, he, in his definition, he also refer, refers to the ma'ani in the uh, hikam, uh, meaning in the purposes of the ahkam, but also he says the asrar of the sharia, and the secrets, the kind of unspoken purposes. Uh, then we have definitions by Al Qaradawi. They say that these are the goal and purposes, the end goals and purposes are al ghayat, aimed at by the commands and prohibitions and the permissibilities uh, of the Sharia and the ahkam juz'iyah, the specific ruling of Sharia, seek to realize them. And uh, if you look at, uh, compare this definition, it seems to tie the maqasid so closely with the commands and prohibition in the text, uh, in the meaning of the text. Uh, uh, then uh, there was a question ari arising, whether these definitions also uh, are inclusive uh, of uh, of uh, the istinbat, inference from the text. Yes, the text carry the ahkam, we know this. But what about inference from the text? And this was uh, Abdullah bin Bayya, again, from a scholar from Africa, Mauritius, a contemporary scholar. He says the ahkam refers to, the, that, that the maqasid refers to the spirit of sharia uh, in the meaning and wisdom uh, of the Sharia that arise from the Khitab al-Shari, from the language of the lawgiver, or through istinbat, from the, from the ahkam, from the text of the Sharia. So here we see a, 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 an addition. Uh, the earlier definition, most of the definition would seem to mean that the uh, maqasid of Sharia are carried by the clear text of the Qur'an uh, in Sunnah. Until we have this addition that either that or the inference from that through ijtihad. And of course, this should have been realized and articulated much earlier because we know that al-Shatibi accepted not only the text of the Qur'an and Sunnah as the carriers of the Maqasid, but also istiqra, inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is ijtihad. It, it is istinbat. It's not really looking at the text as such, but you look at the general reading of the Qur'an and Sunnah, and you find that the text of the Qur'an refer to so many values in different places without actually declaring that this is the maqasid of, or the maqsad of the lawgiver. Istikra is a valid uh, identifier of the maqasid. And istikra partakes in ijtihad. So this should have uh, been articulated in, uh, as it uh, was eventually uh, recognized but there is this kind of apprehension that if you put it to istinbat, I will speak of the three tendencies I mentioned. Uh, where do you draw the line? Uh, and that becomes a, a worrying feature of the maqasid because the maqasid 
unlike the usul al-fiqh, uh, does not have an articulate in elaborate methodology of its own. Whereas the usul al-fiqh has uh, a very, very rich methodology. We, only, we not only have ijtihad, but qiyas and istihsan, sadd al in maslaha, etc., etc. All have their definitions and so on. Uh, but the maqasid is not enriched by these various formulas as such. Uh, <coughs> then further achievement uh, along uh, related to um, the definition of the maqasid uh, was given, uh, it was uh, Ibn Ashur attempted this and he uh, mentioned four uh, four qualifications for the validity of a maqas, of a maqsad of sharia. The, 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 the maqasid, in order to be valid, must fulfill four requirements. It must be zahir, it must be evident, not a hidden factor. It must be sabit, it must be proven, it not su subject to disagreement and disputation. It must be arm in general, such that it applies to all cases and all persons at all times, and not really promote uh, sectarian uh, interests and biases. And it must be tarp. Uh, so it must be tarp that is inclusive of all which belongs to it, and exclusive of all which does not belong to it. For a definition, you have to have this kind of uh, firmness that we, uh, ac we accept uh, um, a maqsad if it would fulfill these four requirements. And these became like the shurut, the tarif and the shurut uh, for the validity of the maqasid. This was another achievement that we uh, had in regards to the definition of the maqasid. The entire maqasid of sh sharia, all of the maqasid are geared towards one thing, and that is human welfare and benefit. This is the mega maqasid, uh, the, the, the governing uh, principle of all the maqasid. Uh, this is Izzuddin Abdus Salam al Sulami, the author of Maqasid al Ahkam fi Masalih al Anama, two volume work. Uh, he lived in 13th century, uh, common era, 6th and 7th century Hijra. Uh, Maqasid al Ahkam fi Masalih al Anam. He, his book carried the name Maqasid, and he says that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is, is a no need of any purposes or any ahkam of the sharia as such. And the purpose of the, all the ahkam is to realize human welfare and benefit. Um, and this is true of the sharia, uh, and these are uh, the valid purposes recognized uh, throughout the ages. Maqasid are also, uh, oh, I'm articulating the methodology of maqasid. The methodology, when we talk about methodology, we speak of the definition, the conditions that it must fulfill, uh, how it is identified, the classification of maqasid, and the uh, means toward achieving them. When you have an understanding of all of these aspects, and I'm speaking of some of them, not in great detail, but also the maqasid. Uh, we spoke on the identification of the maqasid. I will also then speak about the scope, the expanding scope of the maqasid. The maqasid have not remained kind of, you know, like confined to the usul al fiqh or to the legal subject. We speak of the maqasid in conjunction nowadays with Islamic banking and finance, with modernity, with civilization, with education, with so many other things, not just legal subject matter. We are expanding the scope of the maqasid in so many different directions, and you need to have 
that degree of accuracy uh, and, and, and certainty about how you identify. If you open the scope so far, you need to have that, uh, that grip on the kind of, you know, the accuracy of the idea in purpose. So Makasid are identified through their, their wasail. As I said, the Sharia consists of these two aspects, purposes and the means towards achieving them. Makasid and wasail. Sometimes they are all call, also called mukammil and mukammilat, accomplishers, complete something. Um, so in the wasail, <coughs> is an important aspect of, of the maqasid. Uh, they need to be, uh, the maqasid often need to be realized because they are not exact existing fact, as I said earlier, through their wasail. Uh, the wasail are often sometimes mentioned by the nusus, by the text itself, uh, as in the Quran, for example, we have the hifz al-mal, protection of property, as one of the primary, the zaruriyat of the maqasid, promotion and protection of the um, of property. And then we have documentation. Uh, if you extend uh, a uh, an obligation that is fulfilled in the future, then concerning uh, assets and properties, then reduce it into writing. Iza tadayantum bidainin ila ajalin musamman faktubu. So this is a wasila in order to preserve and protect the property from uncertainty in loss. Here we have in the text uh, the wasila for the protection of a certain maqsad given in the clear text. But this is not often the case. Whereas the maqasid are textually based, uh, we cannot create a maqsad, uh, well, I, 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 I suppose I will speak later when I discuss when, uh, I, when, wh whether we can have, we can, whether rationality in aql can be accepted as an identifier of the maqasid. There is something to be said. But uh, maqasid, we need to be uh, well informed of the, um, the sharia generally if we were to speak of the maqasid and their identification to rationality uh, and, and fitra or ijtihad. Uh, but uh, the wasail are not like that. The wasail, we can choose the wasail sometimes through ishtihad, sometimes through just the simple rational thinking. <coughs> if the, if the nusus of the sharia have not given it. Um, there may be several means to, for the realization of one particular purpose. Should that be the case, we should, we should select that which is most direct. Uh, toward realizing that particular maqsad or purpose. And uh, also that the means toward the maqsad or purpose uh, must be proportionate, uh, munasib, uh, with regard to the purpose that it seeks to realize. Uh, and here we have uncertainties coming in. Uh, I will give one or two examples. Sometimes there are exaggerated, exaggerations are made in the use of the wasail, the use of the means toward the realization of maqasid. For example, sometimes a hila or trick is used in order to facilitate a certain purpose, manipulating the means toward achieving a certain purpose. Like Murabaha by Bisaman Ajil in the contemporary Islamic banking and finance, very commonly used contracts. And uh, this is a means towards, uh, uh, is used a means towards making a profit uh, or realizing a certain uh, financial objective. 
but murabaha in baby saman ajil these are varieties of sale these are really uh, trading tools but nowadays they are used so ever so frequently as means for financialization as a disguised means for really uh, earning something that comes close to riba uh, you see initially we have uh, these two as uh, trading instruments, but now we have changed that and use it as a means towards uh, something else in a very exaggerated way, such that it puts uh, into question the validity of the whole of this operation. Um, the Sharia, for example, uh, the dignity of man, karama, of human dignity is protected partially through the rules of aura and in uh, hiding certain kind of uh, it's part of the ethos of Islam and so on uh, but there are some exceptions that uh, uh, the Sharia makes if someone is ill the physician can make and look at the aura of a person but if a certain individual insists at the risk of, you know, uh, serious illness, uh, risk of uh, life, uh, not to allow the physician to do that. It is exaggerating, using a means in a very exaggerated way, in such a way that uh, is not valid. Is not valid. Uh, if you are protecting your dignity, there are ways of doing it, but this is a concession and you are not going to endanger life for something that is in the nature of really tasiniyat. Uh, you know those kind of things. So in the identification of maqasid, uh, we are uh, in, in, in the realization of maqasid, we resort to certain means. And the means are governed by a certain number of rules and the fiqh often provide them. The fiqh provide them through not only definition, but condition, shurut, in arkan, and so on, and stipulation, this must be this fulfilled. These conditions are often meant to protect against exaggeration and against reductionism, and that uh, is to moderate the realization of a certain hukum, uh, and the objectives of that hukum. Um, I now discuss the identification of maqasid in a little bit more detail as it is an important subject that relates to the scope of the maqasid. We said that the Quran and Sunnah are universally accepted by general consensus of the valid source and identifiers of the maqasid provide, provided that the particular verse or hukum is ibtida'i in tasrihi. Ibtida'i that is, is original, it is not attached to some other verse or hukum. It is original in its own right. Tasrihi, it is that explicit, it's not implicit in its meaning, it delivers its meaning clearly. Um, and then also uh, through istinbat in ishtihad, inference in ishtihad uh, is accepted as the valid identifiers of the maqasid. As I earlier mentioned, uh, Al Shatibi has worked on this. Istikra, inductive reasoning, is uh, a valid identifier of the maqasid. And yet, by saying this, we also wonder why have we been so restrictive in the identification of the maqasid. The maqasid, for example, in the category of the ruriyat uh, is five. Five, uh, you know them. That is protection of uh, life, of faith, of uh, intellect, of family, and property. Al-Qarafiya Maliki jurist uh, added a sixth that is ayrd, 
and dignity and honor of the person. This is a sixth maqsad. But we have stayed with this five. Uh, and uh, uh, here when uh, uh, it was Ibn Taymiyyah uh, who asked the question in 14th century, uh, why are we always saying that the Dururiyat of Maqasid, the was essential Maqasid are confined to only five? Or any particular number, look at the Qur'an. The Qur'an speaks of so many things like amana, like truth, like justice, like freedom, like equality, like unity, like uh, wahda, for example, compassion, rahmah. Uh, and there are many taqwa, for example, uh, piety. There, uh, some of them are moral, some of them are attributes of personality, others are objective, justice. Uh, uh, are they not, for example, uh, primary maqasid of Islam? Why are we confining them? We say istiqra is a valid uh, means uh, an identifier of the maqasid. And if you apply istiqra to the Qur'an as I just apply, you are opening the scope of the maqasid in a way that it is really supported by the Qur'an. There are so many verses on, in the Qur'an on justice, and yet the ulama uh, of maqasid and usul al-fiqh in the past did not really tell you that adl and karama inequality in these other are the daruriyat of the maqasid. No, the maqasid are these five. So there is some shortcoming here and why uh, there are restrictions. The restrictions uh, are perhaps the uncertainties that uh, exist as I would explain uh, the why the justice is not identified as the maqasid they say that they are in the nature of the am in the quran the am of the quran is not really firm in specific it applies to so many things unless there is a more specific supportive text in evidence if you apply if you say justice you are opening the door to a lot of things um, so these are the reservations that we have confined ourselves to those things. But the uh, 20th century has opened the door. And uh, uh, Sheikh Ghazali, the teacher of, who died in 1996, Al-Qaradawi, Ahmad al raisuni Abdullah ibn Bayya, and uh, many others, myself, I have written, uh, they have spoken of Adil, Hurriya, and Musawa, justice, freedom, and equality as being the valid Daruriyat and Maqasid Daruri of Islam. Also, uh, socio-economic rights. These are also the objectives of the Sharia to fulfill them. Uh, they say that uh, the five Daruriyat, this is the Ijtihad of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, uh, who, di who died in the 12th century common era, uh, 6th century Hijra. Uh, he uh, tied them somehow to the Hudud and, and you know, came up with these are the essential the Maqasid. That was valid, his Ijtihad, but that doesn't mean that uh, we should just stay with that and not look at the sources of the Sharia in the identification of Maqasid. Um, Nuruddin al-Khadimi, Ahmad al-Raisuni, uh, they also speak of uh, uh, basic human rights as among the Maqasid. And now protection of the environment, Hifz uh, al-Bi'ah is one of the Maqasid because the integrity of protecting all these other daruriyat of maqasid depend now on environmental care. So we reach a certain, uh, a certain milestone or a kind of, you know, stage in the development of uh, civilization that we need to bring in and articulate maqasid 
new maqasa. They find support in the sources of Islam, on, on environment, there is so much in the Quran, on human dignity and rights, there are so much. Uh, I've also said that uh, science and technology should be recognized uh, as one of the maqasid, and world peace should be uh, the maqasid of Sharia, because the, the, the standing of the Ummah depends on scientific and technological achievement and progress. Uh, and so is world peace. We, unless we really attach that value to it. You know, these, uh, these violent groups, whether they are the Shabaab or the Taliban and so many others, they violate the, the priorities of Islam in the name of Islam. This is a total distortion. <coughs> um, then we have uh, Jamaluddin Atiyah, who wrote a book on Taf'il al Maqasid, that is, actualization of the Maqasid. And this is the subject also, an article that I uh, published in a recent issue of our journal. Uh, this is uh, Islam and Civilizational Renewal, our quarterly journal. And this is uh, uh, the July issue 2017, Actualization, Taf'il of the Higher Purposes, Maqasid of Sharia. Uh, and I have published earlier a book, which is uh, Maqasid al-Sharia, Ijtihad and Civilizational Renewal. And these are in the internet. Our journal is also free access um, on our website. And that is um, available. Uh, but actualization of the maqasid um, is, uh, requires a certain degree of accuracy, uh, which I have explained. I mentioned Jamaluddin Atiyah. He has written a book. Uh, he said that, uh, in addition to some of the points I made, that the earlier scholars in ulama, uh, they have not utilized the resources of the maqasid in the area of theology, in kalam. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, this is something that a certain demand, contemporary scholars and contributors to the subject of kalam, have made meaningful contribution and there is a certain demand that um, the resources of the maqasid should be used in the meaning, making the kalam in theology, a meaningful, purposeful discourse. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been kind of grounded in the dialectic logic of the Hellenistic, you know, thought, uh, abstract, you know. Uh, it should be something that is brought closer to the realities of uh, Islamic life and existence. Uh, then again, uh, the point has been made that uh, the resources of the maqasid have not been uh, used or articulated in the realm of politics and governance. Uh, this is an important uh, subject of the Sharia and the uh, the goals and purposes of Sharia, the ethical norms of Islam must be articulated in politics, in history. There is a historical neglect that, you know, dynasties and monarchs and politicians, they uh, did not really um, uh, consider uh, the, the, the resources of the maqasid in the normative guidelines of uh, Islam into their conduct. Are the maqasid independent, for example? Uh, uh, an independent source of ijtihad? Uh, or is it something that is connected and uh, attached to usul al-fiqh? Uh, this is a subject that Ibn Ashur has responded to in affirmatively, 
and he has also referred to earlier writings of Al-Qarafi in Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, who has said uh, something that indicates that the maqasid can be used as a basis independently of ishtihad, and I think it's a valid um, point. Um, uh, Abdullah ibn Bayya has a group disagrees. They say maqasid is not really an independent uh, from the uh, independent from the usul al fiqh you may say that it is a chapter of usul al fiqh like istislah like ta'arud wal tarji conflict in uh, uh, res conflict resolution and so on but uh, not to say that it is an independent uh, source i'll uh, reflect this on it a little further al raisuni ahmad al raisuni says we can recognize it there are differences of opinion. As a separate, uh, it is being taught as a separate course now in many, many countries. Um, but I think this argument is, uh, some details are given, but if you recognize ishtihad maqasidi, uh, to say that uh, ishtihad can be based on the maqasid, then you made that argument redundant, basically. If we are uh, saying that, yes, it is valid, then we have replied to that question to say that, yes, maqasid can be looked at as an independent uh, source of ishtihad. Uh, I'm not advocating that we should isolate the maqasid from the usul al-fiqa. It, it, they are all uh, important aspects of Islamic juristic thought. We should read them side by side and not totally independent by uh, one another. This is not something that when we mention independence, we mean uh, rejection or isolation of something else. Uh, provided, of course, uh, Makasit. Uh, can be the basis of ishtihad, provided that the person who carries that ishtihad is, has comprehensive knowledge of the sharia, in the maqasid, in the priorities of Islam, uh, in the methods of resolution of conflicts, and so on. Hifz al-Aql, for example, is an important area, uh, one of the daruriyat of the maqasid, and it is uh, um, uh, one area where we can bring in uh, education, for example, contemporary issues in Islamic education into the scope of this Hifz al uh, Like when, when the ulama discussed of Hifz al aql they spoke of, you know, that uh, prohibition of wine drinking, it is to protect the integrity of the aql and so on. Giving one or two examples, very restrictive approach. But well, now we say that if we are recognizing uh, promotion and of, the, of intellect and protection of uh, rationality, uh, then we should uh, accept scientific modern science um, and the new methods of education as valid avenues of, uh, of promoting and protecting the hifz al-aql, one of the maqasid of the sharia. Accept them into the educational agenda and program of Islamic institutions, of the madaris, and other ed educational institutions. And uh, not to confine yourself only to the protective and defensive means, but to, in an affirmative sense, that you open these. And if you have that, 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 done that, then you have uh, taken the maqasid uh, in a way that would be um, in tune with the other, you know, the values of our time in civilization. Um, <clears throat> Also, the scholars uh, have spoken of opening the scope of istinbat. We have confined istinbat and ishtihad to several avenues, to some avenues, like analogical reasoning, qiyas. Qiyas is burdened with a lot of conditions and technicality. They said that try to open the scope of istinbat and qiyas, 
away from those, some of the stipulation from, of usul al-fiqah. And accept, for example, the arm of the Qur'an. Uh, you don't have, in order to extract a hukum, to go through the avenue of qiyas and, uh, and you know, interpretation, but open the arm of the ahkam like adl, ihsan, karama, some justice, as the avenues of istinbat. Uh, and I think it's a valid point. Uh, we do not uh, neglect the guidelines of usul al-fiqh, but try to read them in context and open the avenues of protecting the intellect through education, through reflecting of how these value structures of Islam can come and help the avenues of hifz al-aql. If we were to speak of or the maqasid of taisir in raf al-haraj, bringing ease, removal of hardship in the Quran, it is recognized as one of the objectives of Islam. How you bring them into education, into the methods of your teaching, of course, it's a very important guideline. We would say that, uh, that the lecturer, the teacher, the alim must speak the language of his audience, make himself clearly understandable, avoid uh, technical language, avoid you know, too many theoretical stipulations, be direct onto the subject. Uh, also to decide whether we are uh, only informing the people or we are also following certain objective, like uh, improving the character of the person, like fighting certain mischief. If this is the purpose of my lecture, I ought to be aware of this makasib, integrate into the method of my lecturing in education. Um, one area where we uh, uh, do not apply the intellect as a method of promos- promoting and expanding the scope of the ahkam, it is the area of ibadat. The ibadat, we do not speak of the application of aql in the area of ibadat. No, but aql is otherwise rationality is our, int- our only tool to understand the, the ahkam and the essence of responsibility in taklif, our, um, our principal mode of uh, developing uh, the maqasid. Um, and we may speak of the hikmah as being uh, wisdom, as of the ma- uh, part of the maqasid of the sharia. We are concerned with uh, benefit in harm, uh, promotion of benefit and protection of harm. Uh, this is what all the Sharia um, uh, tradition, legal tradition, not the Sharia of Islam, uh, has been doing to promote the avenues of rationality in Aql as an instrument of the valid objective of Islam. So we can say that uh, provided that we accept uh, the principles that we talk about in ishtihad, in maqasid, the kind of guidelines, then rationality can be accepted as an identifier of maqasid. Uh, Izzuddin Abdus Salam say that uh, um, that people in all civilization identify their human rationality is capable of detecting benefit and harm in human conduct and so on. And uh, aql is our guideline. Aql is, uh, takes its, uh, its data from the senses, but it expands uh, provided that the aql operates in the guidelines of Wahya. And I think that uh, 
uh, I have been speaking a great deal, but uh, maybe the last point that uh, uh, I uh, one or two points that uh, I make it briefly is whether fitra, innate human nature, can be accepted as an identifier of the maqasid. Fitra is a human disposition that the Quran speaks about. It is our innate human nature is inherent in all of us and it is a universal concept. When uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the human being as the vice gerent and trustee of the earth and uh, and then speaks of the dignity of karama walaqad karamna bani adam of the dignity of human being and islam speaks identifies itself as deen al fitra and gives allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, human being a rank above the angel there is a degree of trust in the fitra of human being that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the aql and fitra move hand in hand. Our intellect learn from our fitra. Like uh, our uh, inner, inter, inner makeup, mm, the enormous amount of communication, the genetic information within us, cellular and intercellular communication, and how our inner makeup informs our senses informs our aql we have not explored enough our fitra inner fitna allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the cosmos from within that is manifested in certain ways outside but we have not really looked sufficiently uh, we don't have the means now genetic technology in engineering in like uh, the new neuroscience and so on, discover certain things. But um, the akal is informed by the lights of human fitra. If we understand our fitra properly, then it goes hand in hand with the objectives of Sharia. It is uh, our rationality is embedded in our fitra. So that is something that. Uh, and Ibn Ashur and others spoke about that uh, uh, that you need to observe human fitra in your activities like it is in the fitra of a child that he cannot be prompted uh, to sit in uh, in certain you know early too much early tutoring a child of one year it's not in the nature of a child child learns through play if you impose that you violate it and you, uh, your purpose is frustrated. This can be said in many other areas. Uh, there has been a certain degree, my last point, uh, of effort by the ulama of usul uh, to say that uh, um, that uh, the maqasid uh, are a part of the usul al-fiqh and they will tell you that if you the maqasid is a part of the rationale and the effective cause in the illa of the hukum if you understand the rationale of the hukum you understand the purpose of that hukum and this would be uh, a way of saying that uh, the rules of Allah and that there is a lot of uh, detail. S uh, some scholars have gone on record to tell you there are about 40 conditions that Allah must fulfill in order to be a valid Allah for the construction of analogy in Qiyas. If you do all of that, then you defy your purpose. There is no need for analogy and qiyas. Uh, to subsume the maqasid or the maqsad under the concept of illa, uh, it's not accurate. 
although the ulama have spoken. I have written about it and I said that illa is basically different to maqsad because illa is tied to the status quo ante. Uh, it, there must be a hukum in existence in the past for the illa to be extracted from it and then on that basis you construct a new hukum. So illa is a part of the status quo. Whereas when you speak of the maqasid and maqsad, it, you're not tying yourself to the past. You are future oriented. You are talking of modernity and civilization, the purposes that we want to achieve. If you write, if you tie yourself to the concept of illa, as the ulama of usul have said, no need to for a look for the maqsad, look into the illa. That is an error that has been made by the uh, usul writers and the scope of the maqasid need not be uh, tied in that way and need not be really restricted in a way that uh, the usul al-fiqh has been presented to us. Uh, the usul al-fiqh is, uh, is, uh, has enriched the, us the Islamic juristic thought in so many ways and this is another area of doing the same, enriching we utilize the resources, but we do not confine the maqasid only to the usuli uh, or to the juristic constructs, but it, uh, there are other things that we uh, can look into the sources of the maqasid and open the scope of the maqasid. And there is so much in the sources of the Islam, the Quran in the Sunnah. And the richness of the contributions of the scholars in the fiqh tradition and others uh, that we utilize all of those and uh, uh, look into Islam, the maqasid and Islamic values uh, in, in, in a way that, uh, uh, that opens fresh avenues for human progress, for civilization. Thank you. as alaykum. Thank you very much, Prof. Hashim. Now I would like to open the floor for any questions. <coughs> Prof, if I may. Just now you were saying about one of the branch of Makosid that we have to look into is on the world peace. Could you please explain a bit more about that? One of the, so we have social? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, world peace, yes. Right. Right. I say it is one of the maqasid of, uh, <coughs> of the Sharia, world peace, uh, because there is support for, his, for it. Uh, Islam, the name, comes from Selm, from Salam, from peace. Uh, in, you talk of the maqasid of the Ruriyat you cannot realize any of them at war time. And this peace becomes instrumental for the realization not only of the maqasid, but the ahkam of sharia are also suspended. In war time, you cannot really talk meaningfully of the rule of law. Uh, and uh, if you talk of the protection of life, uh, have, uh, in, that is one of the primary, primary doruriyat. Uh, then you must also mean uh, prevention of violating the sanctity of life. Uh, in the Quran, uh, there are verses, and if, if there is an opportunity for peace, 
to make peace as a reality. Uh, and uh, uh, since peace is so instrumental to the entire Sharia, to the sanctity and meaning of life, and there is so much violence as we see, so much distortion of uh, the uh, of not just of life, but all of the structure of the Ruriyat. When you look at the kind of atrocities that the world has been witnessing, and by Islamic State, by Al Shabaab, by Boko Haram, and by Taliban, and by so many, after the 9 11, we have had all of these varieties of violent groups emerging. Uh, because I think that there has been militarism has been on the rise. Uh, and most of them, these uh, are incidentally, they are reactive. Uh, we see these uh, instances emerging after attacks on Iraq, on Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Libya, and others. Uh, if you push people to the corner, they, they rebel. This is what is unfortunately. I'm not justifying any of this. But there is so much violence, some of it is reactive, most of it is misguided, but unless you make peace as a primary value in the Ruriyat of Islam and Sharia, you cannot protect or talk meaningfully of any other values. Any other questions? Okay, Prof, there is no question from the floor. And now I will call upon Prof Ahmad Sidin to be accompanied by Dr. Rupaning for to present Prof Hashim with some token of appreciation from the organizer. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so there goes our morning session. Our parallel session will start later um, at 2 p.m. in the Senate room um, of our satellite building on the fifth floor. So I will see you later. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum.